like suddenly this mommy government had evolved, and that's symptomatic of everything we're seeing in the society of underfathered and overmothered. Hi, I'm Evelyn Ray. Welcome to the Cauldron Pool Show. I have an incredible guest. Um, I wanted to get him on because uh, I found that lately we've been thinking very similarly with some of the things online, having some good back and forths, and um, I thought it'd be really beneficial moving forward to talk about biblical masculinity, what that means, um, and some of the things that we're faced with today, being able to witness false teachings on it and positive teachings on it. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Will Spencer. Hi, Evelyn. Thanks so, thanks so much for having me on. You're welcome. Now, as I said, like we've been thinking very similarly on a lot of issues surrounding biblical masculinity and biblical femininity, um, sharing a lot of posts. And I thought, you know what, let's let's hash this out. Let's have a chat about it, because I think it's really necessary, uh, particularly because we're getting it so wrong in terms of the yeah. online space. Um, but before I sort of get into the heart of these topics, I would love it if you wouldn't mind giving us a little introduction about who you are. Um, I know you do a podcast yourself, so feel free to talk a little bit about that. But um, I do know at the top of your Twitter feed, and people can go there as well, you wrote a post about how you've been a Christian um, for a fairly short amount of time, I, I would I would guess, um, that you've yeah. been studying religion for a really long time. And basically it led you to a place where there's nothing else that is possible <laughs> other than Christ is King. Um, so feel free to go into that if you like, and a bit of a bio about yourself. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my, my, my faith journey is, uh, is its own, is its own tale, but, uh, I'll start with what I do now. Uh, I'm the host of the Renaissance of men podcast and the Renaissance of men is a 40 year process to redeem masculinity. It's God's story that he's telling about uh, the 150 year war on masculinity and what the response to that has been, which has been to redeem men, to redeem women and to redeem families. And so we're seeing a resurgence of that and it's kind of culminating right now in Christ in a, in a revival of sorts of Christianity within the, public, within the public sphere. So I talk to influencers and leaders throughout reform Christianity, as well as in the masculinity space and really anyone I find interesting, um, which is the great blessing of having a podcast. Uh, I also do 12 week mentorships for men and host a men's group. And uh, I'm working on a documentary film project as well about the Renaissance of men. That sounds incredible. Um, I have read Michael Foster's book, It's Good to Be a Man. I'm not sure if you've read mm -hmm. that book as well, um, yep. but I found that really helpful as a woman actually taking an interest in that. Um, and I think it's really helpful um, that men have a place to be with men. And I think that the bromance is that in layman's terms, like men mm. having friendships is often shunned uh, by society and is often seen as an unattractive thing if men love men um, in a completely platonic friendship way. But I think it's a beautiful thing. And I'm, I'm really encouraged seeing groups of men coming together to support men and to be there for men. And I love that. But as a sister in Christ, I love to just like kind of peer behind the curtain and look into those spaces and just yeah. get an idea of things. It's really helpful for me as a woman because like God in his great divine wisdom, he has created us to complement one another and he has created us with very unique and different roles. And so for me, um, it's helpful for me to see, I guess, the other side of the coin, how God created men, because it is a patriarchal world, whether people like it or not. And that's a beautiful thing. That's how God made it. So being in a patriarchal world as a woman, it's helpful to understand the patriarchy. Would you would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And and there's also a process of men rediscovering each other. Uh, I think one of the side effects of modernity is that we're all very isolated from each other. COVID was just the most uh, the latest expression of that. But men have been growing apart from each other for decades. They've been atomized. And so as men, one of the one of the great aspects of Michael Foster's book, as well as much, uh, much of today's writing about masculinity, is the need for men to come back together in community and really rediscover each other. And you, you mentioned the word bromance. And uh, what's really interesting about that word is it has shame built into it. It naturally uh, emotionalizes or sexualizes male friendships, but male friendships have been the building block of society. And so we have this word bromance that makes them makes men naturally suspect each other. Right. And it's a it's a very powerful it's a very powerful world at word as all the language weapons that we experience today are. 
but men are starting to get past that and recognize no we need we need brotherhood we need strong bonds of affection and affinity for each other and that's okay and if you look basically back through all of history like read the iliad these men loved each other right that's just a classic pre-christian example of of masculine brotherhood these men truly loved each other and men are starting to rediscover that which is incredibly exciting and um and there's going to be a lot of pushback from it as well yeah and i think there's a lot of pushback against men in general as a society yeah. and i think that's why there is such a need for these things particularly now because men have been very effeminate and it's been very intentional for a long time yeah. i think that society has literally been designed and programmed to hate men for you know like i think you mentioned 150 years is that is that sort of the logic with that time frame yeah so so uh i identify that there's been a war on masculinity for about 150 years it's probably a little bit longer but 150 years at least in the united states goes back to the start of the industrial revolution and the industrial revolution uh, as robert Bly, the author of iron john who, which uh, the book that i think started the renaissance of men he said um the indust the love unit most damaged by the industrial revolution has been the father-son bond where the father who used to pass along values to his son as a tradesman was then taken and put into the factories children were put into public schools and it all started then that's when the family really started to be ripped apart um, and they followed that up with two world wars and a great depression and so what we're experiencing as doug wilson says is, is an epidemic of father hunger that i think can be rooted back to that era of history that no one really looks at we look at men being effeminate, we look at men being weak and divided from each other. It's like, how do we get here? I think that's where it all really, really started. It's interesting you mentioned the Industrial Revolution because I have read and studied C.R. Wiley a fair oh, bit. Yeah. And his work is, he really emphasizes how dangerous the Industrial Revolution was and how it took men from the home for a specific purpose, but they never came back. Um, yes. And he sort of says, you know, that they needed to build and it was a time of infrastructure and bettering society, but it came at the cost of men, yeah, never returning to their homes once those things were achieved. Um, and I love C.R. Wiley's work with that because he also talks about how historically speaking, men worked from the home. You see, yes. the, and the way that modern secular society sort of paints it is, e even though women are in the workforce, it still has been like with the boomer generations that men go to work, women stay at home. But he's saying that's all completely wrong. The family yeah. stay at home together, men included. And I love that um, C.R. Wiley kind of mainstreamed that and put that on paper and someone like me could read that and it was just one of those moments where i went yeah wow i'd never thought of it like that but where in the bible um or in history has it been normal for men to not work with their families and their sons um and that's why it's interesting as well because jesus is assumed to be a carpenter not because it actually says he's a carpenter but because uh, with the you know contextuality of the Bible, it's just whatever the fathers did, so did the son. And his Joseph was a carpenter, so that's the assumption, um, and it's probably a fair assumption. And so it is a very modern idea that men work away from the home. How do you see today? Because this is the difficulty. We know what the answers are, right? We know that things are not going particularly well. But society is set up in such a way that if we were to just go cold turkey, we would probably have withdrawals and die. So how is it that we do get men back in the home without them losing their homes and their mortgages? How is it that we get men and women to return to these more historic and, I guess, biblical ways of running a household with these modern, I guess, boundaries that sort of block us from achieving that? Mm hmm. I think um, I think the answer to that is that the men have to want it, meaning uh, you can't I don't think you can just come from the top down and say, hey, everybody, this is how we're supposed to be living and this is what we're going to do. I think men and women and families have to recognize this is the healthy way of doing it. This is the God ordained divinely, the divinely directed way for us to do it. And so if we feel that call within our hearts, then we begin moving in that direction with all deliberate speed using, you know, every, mean po every means possible to us. And we trust that God will make a way. 
because I, I can't tell an individual man from the situation that he's in, here's the five steps that you got to follow. I mean, to, to mm -hmm. get out of any unique individual situation, any man and, or family's uh, unique economic situation, their social situation, their relational situation, it's very hard to do prescriptions. But if you know within your heart as a man or a woman, this is actually what the Bible teaches. This is good and just, and this promotes human thriving in a godly way. Gosh, I guess we just have to do it and figure it out along the way. But it's mm -hmm. that it's that that feeling, that conviction that that has to that, that has to be done. That is the first that is the essential first step. And then I would mm -hmm. say to men to find their way into communities and then to find their way into churches as well that support them in those desires. And that can often be more difficult than it sounds. It's not easy to just find a bunch of guys who are like, yeah, I think we should return to a more biblical way of living, <laughs> right? Yeah. But that's the that's the well, that's the beauty of the internet as well, is that it's accessible for just about anyone to start creating content, whether it be a podcast or PDF so they can sell or YouTube videos, and to begin monetizing their personal interests and their personal journeys, to begin developing secondary sources of income to build a bridge. And uh, those, are the, those are the basic first steps, but I think it really begins with the conviction of modernity is not working. It's actually leading us in a godless direction. And uh, we don't want to follow that direction anymore. So we're going to go in a godly direction. And this is what he's laid out for us. So this is the way I think we're going. Mm. And I think I, I, I totally agree with that. It does start with the heart. You mean, you can coerce people into things, drag them there. But, you know, it, unless people are truly changed and regenerate in, with ideas in their heart, yes. it's going to just fall back to the same habitual mistakes and habits of their previous life before that. Um, but I think C.R. Wiley mentioned things like, you know, men are very capable creatures and not everybody is, uh, you know, a tradesman these days, but I think he started a business with his sons and his children yeah. doing real estate, I believe. Um, and I think that's a beautiful thing. So there are so many ways that men can be more involved in the home. And um, yeah, I love that, you know, he sort of goes into that. I think it was Vody Borkham as well. He, um, they homeschool like, and he, his lectures on home education, Christian education, sorry, um, is sort of what sold me on the idea I'm going to homeschool my babies and no one's going to touch them. Like that's just going to happen. Yeah. I've already made my mind up on that. And he was real pivotal in that conviction for myself. And I love, I think it's his wife sort of does the children in their infancy and their younger primary sort of years. But once the boys hit a more mature age and start to transition from boys to men, they come under his care and he then takes that mm -hmm. responsibility and they go around and you see, often see his sons with him when he's preaching and doing all that. And I, I think that's wonderful, that father-son sort of bond. Um, and I wanted to sort of get into fatherlessness because I think this is an epidemic in yeah. itself. Um, I have statistics on fatherless homes and I got these from the um, – Oh, the Department of Justice or something in, in America. Um, so they're not that I'm in Australia, but you know, these are, these are sure. American statistics, but they're horrific. Fatherless homes, I think account for like 70% higher rate of all kinds of things, high school dropouts, mental illness, violent crimes, um, homelessness, all kinds of things. It's, it's truly horrible when you look at the statistics, but people don't want to look at them. <laughs> people, yeah. um, don't seem to acknowledge how important the role of fathers are. Do you think that fatherlessness is part of the problem of today's society? Yes, very much so. It's actually it's actually a two pronged problem. I think we'd all agree that uh, we live in an underfathered age. Again, as Doug Wilson says, father hunger. I might call it a father famine at this point. But not only are we underfathered, we're overmothered. And those are two independent interlocking problems. And so what we're beginning to see as men are rising up in, in their masculinity and their godly masculinity, and in some ways not godly masculinity, is we're getting pushback from the overmothered aspects of our society. COVID was not, was not authoritarian in a fatherly way. COVID was, a th well, in part, maybe it was more so that way in, in Australia, uh, in, in the United States, it was, it was a very overmotherly kind of way. Like, who are we, we're saving? We're saving grandma. Like, why are we saving grandma? And the shaming involved with putting on masks, very little in terms of like outright overt pressure. It's like suddenly this mommy government had evolved. And that's symptomatic of everything we're seeing in the society of underfathered 
and overmothered. And and it, that's why I love the example that you gave of Vodi Bakum because it's so essential for children once they reach a certain age, especially boys, to graduate from the world of the mother into the world of the father. And if you never let a, a boy graduate from the world of the mother, if she won't let him go, right? If she if she holds on to him, it creates weak, fearful boys who essentially crumble on the inside and never become what they are. And it actually makes them mistrustful of men. So they they don't, they never actually, with the failure to launch, that's kind of what's involved with that, is boys not being allowed to graduate from the world of the mother to the world of the father. And so we're seeing that societally as men starting to sort of embody and embrace their masculinity. There's a societal pushback coming from it. It's like, no, no, the mother's not letting the boys go, um, but we're going to go anyway. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I often get a lot of pushback when I mention this. And you mentioned yes. over, you know, um, we get a lot of pushback for it. Let's, let's be real, Will. We get it right, for everything. Yes. <laughs> but um, a lot of like uh, men who have been raised by single mothers or often come at the defense and go, well, I didn't turn out like that. And I often say, well, that's great. You're in that 15, 20 25% that got lucky or God put his grace on you um, for whatever reason, or your mother did an exceptional job of fighting these statistics. And mm -hmm. what would you say to um, men who don't have fathers? Where, where do they fit and how do they get through this? And, and how do they respond to people like us who talk about fatherlessness? Yeah, I think the first thing just to back up for a second is that if a, if a man says, well, I didn't turn out like this and I had a single mother, I might actually challenge that man. I might actually say, well, did you have some sort of strong father figure in your life, a coach, an uncle, you know, some older man, a pastor who helped introduce you to, to masculinity? Because again, you know, Robert Bly was not a Christian man, but he understood some very fundamental things about men and masculinity. And he, he said, a, a woman can change an embryo into a boy, but it takes a man to turn a boy into a man. So if a man manages to beat the odds, he probably had a strong male figure come into his life and come alongside him and mentor him. So I might really push back on, on whether some anonymous person on the internet really beat the odds. Um, but uh, because this is what I see, this is what I see in my work, like, yes, okay, you have a productive and healthy job and you're, you're showing up in society, but are you really leading? Are you really leading in your community? Are you really leading your life? Are you the man that God made you to be or are you barely functional? And I think we can aspire to much more than barely functional. So where can where can men find good male leadership? Well, um, I think the, the best answer available right now is you have to look online, is you have to look and, and see the men that are embodying the virtues and values that you want to cultivate and you begin absorbing their content, interact with them if you can, read the books, right? Uh, because I would normally like to recommend the church but I think there's an epidemic of effeminacy within the Christian church as well that it's beginning to deal with. And so it's not necessarily always reliable that you'll find uh, strong, uh, strong masculinity within churches, although I know many men that are trying to change that. But I think the really, the blessing of the internet age is that there are so many good men, virtuous men who are stepping up and wanting to offer a fatherly energy for a generation that has never known fathers. Um, and I think that those are relatively easy to find. And, and part of what I try to do with the Renaissance of Men is highlight and, and give those men a, a platform so that they can reach more individuals looking for them. Hmm. I love that. And I think that, to be honest, I think we're in an epidemic as well of parentlessness. Like, I think yeah. that there are plenty of households who do have a father and a mother there, but are they really involved in yeah. forming the soul of their child. And I think unfortunately modernity and secularism has pitted children up to almost be an inconvenience as opposed to a blessing. Children were once oh, yeah. a, a pride and joy and it was, it was such a privilege and an honor to raise children. And now it's like, well, we have to do it, so we'll do it. And there just seems to be a real sort of, um, impartial attitude to it like oh well i've had kids um i i feed them i clothe them they've got a roof over their head i i drive them to school every day i've done my job i'm doing a really good job i think it's really sad particularly for me as a woman i see mothers not take up the call of motherhood 
You know, they think that growing a child in their womb means that they're just a mother, but it's so much more than that. And, you know, I think that we really need to go back to a place where we, every single child is an eternal soul. This isn't Mm -hmm. something to play with. Like every human being is made in the likeness of God and has an eternal soul. They're either going to be eternally damned to hell or they're going to spend eternity with Christ or be glory to him. So (laughs) we have such a big responsibility as men and women um, to not just take on the title or the name of mother or father, but to actually live it out and to actually um, do it right. Um, so I think there are a lot of fatherless homes who technically have a father there. And there are a lot of motherless homes that technically have a mother there. Would, would you agree with that as well? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You can have, you can have an intact married couple, you know, uh, raising kids, but the home is essentially atomized. You know, people are on their devices in front of screens. Maybe the parents are married, but they're not creating an environment that, you know, for example, brings up the the son or daughter or daughters and in, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so what you end up having in that scenario is rather than rather than, let's say, um, a bed that lifts everyone up or a floor that lifts everyone up, you have a net that kids fall through. And where do they fall through to? They fall through onto their screens, onto their devices, the lowest common denominator in the schools or, or in their culture. And so uh, the the parents, the mother and the father, they have to have a, an understanding of the value of human life. And I think we've really, truly lost that. And abortion, of course, is the most obvious example. Yeah. But that's there's also a way in which like what you just said, every human being is an eternal soul. Like when, when I got that, when I first heard that, I was like, oh, wow, that's true. That's yeah. heavy. That's heavy. Yeah. And if we all walked around with that understanding that this person that you're interacting with face to face on a screen, whatever, or even anonymously online, this is this is a, a human being with an eternal soul just like you, then and, and, and we get to embody that on this earth. That we get to we get to image God here. <laughs> mm-hmm. If you if we understood each other in that way and we really valued that, then I think we would be living in a very different society with a very different set of values. But we don't know how to value human life, which also means we don't know how to value our lives. Like, oh, I'm just I'm just I, you know I'm just a, what is it from the Matrix? Like humans are a cancer on the planet. And so, what do we see in the in the climate change theology? We are a cancer on the planet, and we have to eradicate the cancer on the planet so the so the planet can live. Now, again, I want to point out that the planet is Mother Nature. We need to sacrifice ourselves for Mother Nature. Again, we have the overmothering of the world, you know, and mm-hmm. and so we can't value humans because we're being overmothered. We can't graduate past this feminist theology, is what I call it, and so it keeps showing up over and over again. Mm. I think that I think that Satan knows that he can't defeat God, right? He knows that he can't. <laughs> like, like that's not that's not that's not even a fair fight. And he knows that, right? Because he he's dwelt in the presence of God before, and he fell from that. So he he knows the the awe and majesty of God, and he knows he can never defeat him. So what does he do? Now? What what does he do? He comes after those who reflect God. He comes after yes. their image bearers. That's what it is. And and everything he does is to attack anything that reflects God's goodness and what is good. Uh, and that is men and women who are made in his likeness. And that's why it's under attack. That's why the family is under attack because all of these things reflect. God. And um, you can just see it in everyday life, how it's just attacked. Um, And unfortunately, when you have something good, another way isn't just a direct attack. Another way is um, through manipulation and confusion and apathy and complacency. And something that I'm seeing a lot of is these subversions of something that is good. And it's almost painted with a veneer or a surface covering to trick you into thinking that this is good. For example, the patriarchy, that is a really good thing. And that is by God's design. God created the world to be patriarchal. And now what we're seeing is a subversion of patriarchy where people are saying that they're part of the patriarchy and they're saying all of these things, trickling a little bit of truth, trickling a little bit of goodness, but at the root of this subversion of patriarchy is rot and the same trash that um, 
you know, leads to depravity. And so it's really, it, it, it takes a lot of work to have discernment in figuring out what games the devil's playing here and how we can figure out what's good and, and what's bad. So if we're going to biblical masculinity, how, how would you define that? And, and what would you say to young men who would like to know what does it actually mean? What does biblical masculinity actually mean? Yeah, I mean, I all, all different men have all different lists, and you can look through the secular world, and you can look through the Christian world. But I really like um, what I heard from Vody Bakum recently. He said, uh, "Prophet, priest, prophet, priest, protector, and provider." I think it was those four. It was those four things, and. You know, uh, I uh, Ryan Mickler talks about protect, provide, preside. You know, there there are all kinds of other. You know, he he's also a successful creator in the masculinity space. But I really like Vody Bauckham's breakdown because it's simple, um, and I think you need to start. I mean, masculinity is incredibly complex. You know, it's it's a very as is femininity, but um, it's a it's the sort of thing where men have been writing about it and celebrating it and thinking about it for thousands of years. And you can't boil it down into into uh, one simple soundbite, but you need to for a generation that's suffering from father hunger, something that they can just take with them that plants the seed. And what I like about Vody Bauckham's breakdown is I think protector and provider are pretty, I think they're pretty straightforward. I think that calls to the heart of every man what he wishes to be. That's why we watch movies like Braveheart or the Lord of the Rings, you know, to be want like young boys run around with swords or play cowboys and Indians because they want to be the perfect, the protectors or because they, they build things, the construction kids, because they want to be the providers, right? This is, this is something that's built into us that God designed within us as men and that we relate to very easily. The notions of, of priest and prophet, I think are a little bit um, more difficult, but are no less important. And I believe that the prophet is the one who represents God to men and the priest is the one who represents men to God. And so to be the father, to hold that role and to facilitate that, commun that communication from down, from, uh, from above to down here onto the, onto the earth, I think is, is very, very important for guidance. Because if you're a man who just protects and provides without divine guidance, you know, without, without God informing, godliness informing what you're doing, it, it runs into self-servingness very quickly. To become the best the best protector you possibly can which is like i'm just why am i doing this well just so i can beat the other guy or to become the best provider that i can and we see a lot of this why oh so i can get the high score you know mm -hmm. but if you're doing it for the kingdom if you're doing it in a godly way these things kind of fade into the background but they don't lose their power they don't they just get rooted in something higher themselves and you get to put them into service and that i think orients a man both horizontally to the world that he lives in and vertically to the divine and then i think you can have a truly fulfilled truly fulfilled man so that's that's the breakdown that i think i like the best because it, it helps men really know well it's not enough to simply be horizontally oriented and it's not enough to be vertically oriented you need both to be balanced and whole mm. Yeah, that's really great. I actually haven't listened to Vody Borkham's talk on that yet, but um, you've inspired me. I might ha I might have a look at it because um, I, I like how you put that and how he put that um, because you often hear a lot of people, again, saying men are protecting and providing, um, but they're abusing their authority over us or they're doing this sure. or doing that. Um, and whether or not it's as common as women like to make it out to be, I don't know. I would, I'll leave that open for speculation. Um, people love to be victims and by being a victim, you don't have to be personally responsible. Um, you sort of abdicate that. So I'm aware of that. But I think having a man who does protect and provide, but has, like you said, priest and prophet, that definitely is what anchors that into that limited um, and delegated authority from God to the man as the head of the home. Um, yeah. Because I think that's important to remember with biblical masculinity as well. Um, just from my own sort of understandings that um, all authority is, is God's none like yeah. men have authority, right. But that's only because God has delegated it to that man. Um, Amen. And that, that delegated authority that he has is still limited, right? It's not, yeah. it's not libertarian in nature. It's not complete freedom. It's literally delegated and limited. And I think that's important 
um, for masculine these uh, biblical masculinity movements to um, yeah to keep in mind moving forward. And I think that's what separates biblical masculinity from worldly masculinity. And I think that it's kind of um, the differ differing points, I guess you would say, because you see a lot of people like Andrew Tate, who are these alpha masculine movement um, pinup guys. And, you know, sure, they can protect he's a fighter, whatever, I don't know, he can, he can provide, he's a millionaire, um, but he's not anchored at all in anything good or godly, which is why it's sort of an abomination of those things of Genesis 2.15. Um, now, I'm seeing a lot of people fall for this, and I, I don't want to harp on it too much, but um, would you advise men to, you said earlier, go on the internet, and and you can find some really good men but how how do they how, how do people wade through you see a lot of people you know hook line and sinker on these andrew tate guys on these guys that have these flashy um apartments penthouse apartments with half naked chicks and money and this and but then they say conservative talking points so like <laughs> right yeah like it's just but but you see a lot of christian people who just fall for this and not only christian men who apologize for him you see women simping for him. And I'm just thinking, ladies, what is wrong with you? It, you would hate to be married to that man. You would hate it. You would hate for your children to be raised by that man. What are you doing? Um, do you see a lot of this as well in your on, online sort of scrolling? And, and how? what advice would you give to people when it comes to picking who they follow online in this space? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really, it's a really relevant question. And my answer to it is, is one word is virtue. Virtue is a word that we've lost in our in our culture that's been slowly being ebbed away. And we see it in the arts and architecture. We see it in, in the degrading quote unquote beauty standards, right? Our world is getting ugly because it's being drained of virtue. Um, now, when you think about a man like Andrew Tate, certainly he has, there are virtues that he has. For example, he's very confident, very outspoken. He's very productive, but he's not a virtuous man. And it didn't used to be a question, and I don't think that he described himself as a virtuous man. It didn't used to be a question in the foundations of Western civilization and ancient Rome and, and Greece that the, the life of a virtuous man is what we were all meant to aspire to as men. That wasn't a question. That was what we all looked towards. That was the North Star that we oriented ourselves toward. And that's the power of Jesus Christ is he's the ultimate virtuous man. He is the God man. Right? He, he is virtuous in a way that contradicts almost all of the virtues of, of humans because uh, God's ways are not our ways. He is the ultimate epitome of human virtue. And so that was what we all aspired to. But when you removed God the Father and the Son from American civilization, let's say, or Western civilization, right? we lost the notion of virtue, of what to look at. And very slowly it ebbed away before we lost any notion of what virtue was at all. And so now instead we look at power and virtue and power are often very much at odds right now virtue has a certain power to it which is why which is why people are drawn to it but it's a spiritual power rather than a material power and so men who don't have an understanding of what spiritual power is or what virtue is they orient themselves towards women too they orient themselves towards that source of power right material power and so that's what men like andrew tate embody is material power because we don't have any sense that there's anything higher than that. We don't have any sense like material power is the highest thing to strive for because we lost the sense of Christ's sacrifice and redemption. We lost that sense. And so, you know, this Andrew Tate is not, a, he's not a new phenomenon. Certainly he's, he's the new guy on the scene talking about old things in a, in a very, um, a very embodied way, right? Like, uh, you know, the Manosphere is a great example. These guys talked about fighting and they talked about making money and they talked about, you know, being with lots of chicks and that's what the Manosphere was. Well, I, I call Andrew Tate the apex predator of the Manosphere. He came along and he was the guy who did all the things that the other guys just talked about, right? Mm. But he's not the end of the conversation. If the conversation is Nietzschean, if it's materialist, yeah, sure, he's the end of the conversation. And you can have that. You can have that, but you can see you can see where that leads, maybe not now, but run it forward 30 years, run it forward 30 years, because when you live in this Nietzschean materialist way, where it's like, I'm the most powerful guy, 
well, what happens when you're not able to be a powerful guy anymore? What happens when the other powerful guy comes along and knocks you off and takes your stuff? Are you celebrating the triumph of your materialistic view? Oh, I lost a power. It's like, oh no, it's not fair. It's like, well, there's a better way of living. There's a better way of living, which is following God's way, which is a more sustainable way of living, which means you might not have all the material power that you want. But I think the Bible has some pretty clear teachings in the book of Ecclesiastes about the limits of material power and what it ultimately gets you. Because Kim's, King Solomon is very clear, all is vanity, all is vanity. Mm -hmm. And King Solomon had more than any man on earth today can ever dream of having. And at the end of his life, he realized it was vanity. And, and I think that that's how the Bible can have teachings that are very relevant to, to men and women, Christian men and women, and secular men and women as well. You go questing for power, you will find it turns to dust in your hands. And there is a, there is a better way of being, and that way of being is embodied in virtue. Um, it's harder to achieve, but it's ultimately so much more rewarding. And so the message that I try to promote is men and women, please please go for virtue please become virtuous individuals because that's what this world needs not more power and money mm, absolutely i think freedom without virtue is just chaos um, yeah. and i think that there are countless examples of that coming to fruition um, i get a lot of i get a lot of pushback as well um, in the space of femininity and biblical womanhood when i try to talk about being a virtuous woman you know, I'm not allowed to comment on what people are wearing. You just let people wear what they want to wear. Let people do this. Let people do this. And, right. you know, I, I'm not here going to arrest people if they have a skirt an inch above their knee. I'm not going to, you know, um, be nasty or cruel. But at some point in time, I think this is where, you know, brotherhood and sisterhood should be a huge part of our lives and our accountability because it's kind of, it is a biblical concept to keep one another accountable. People say, all the time you're not allowed to judge it says in the bible to not judge and i'm like well i'd like to question how you read the bible because the entire bible is about judging right that's exactly but, what it's about <laughs> it's like god you know literally it literally the question was asked how is it that we can tell who is a christian and who is not a christian and the answer is you will know them by their fruit well how do you know them by their fruit you have to examine the fruit you actually have to look at it and say is this fruit good or is this fruit rotten that's part of the process how do you know otherwise um judging when you're a hypocrite that's a different that's that's the context of a lot of the verses that people throw out there about not judging but i think that it's healthy for us to judge one another. And I think that having that rapport for me as a woman with that sisterhood and the biblical femininity sort of thing, it's healthy to sort of go back. I was recently convicted um, on bikini wearing, right? I was, mm. well, I, I haven't worn it for, for quite some time, right? But um, I will wear it at home in my own backyard pool when maybe family are over. And I, just, and I thought recently, huh, what about nieces and nephews, right, who might see me right. in that at home? I was like, hmm, I wouldn't do it in public and I wouldn't go to the beach like that and I would never put photos like that. I, and I've never, I've never really been that sort of person even before I was a, a Christian. By God's grace, I had a very low self-esteem. That was like it is, there was no virtue there. It was just by God's grace I hated what I looked like so I didn't wear scandally clothes, right? That's sure. purely God's grace. But, um, you know, I've made a decision for quite a while to not dress like that in public, but then I thought I need to change how I do it at home, right? Um, when they're, Especially when there's, you know, young family members or kids or something that might be influenced. I go, oh, well, Auntie Evelyn does that, so it must be okay. And then they take that outside of that context. And so I was mm. recently convicted on those things and it's only because I was okay for the sisterhood to judge me on those things and question, and not that I was in judgment for it, but I just was watching conversations, healthy conversations between women about the effects of those sorts of things. And I thought, oh, that's really, I'm going to, I'm, I'm a bit convicted. I'm going to rebuke myself on this and I might change how I do that now. And I think it's healthy. That's how you keep virtue in check. And I'm, I'm sure it's similar for the brotherhood as well. Like you kind of need each other to rein one another in. Yes. I think men maybe, take that a little bit better than women though. Would you, would you say that? Oh, I, I mean, perhaps. I, I think men and women have very different hierarchies. I think men organize hierarchies in terms of pyramids with a quote unquote alpha male, right? That's, or, or the leader, right? 
and and I don't like the I don't like the terms leaders and followers because I think there's judgments embedded in those terms now. I think um, leaders and leaders and, and men who like to belong. Let's put it that way. And I think that they're very hierarchical. And I think women um, tend to be more uh, flat and and circular. I mean, there, there's a there's a queen bee who kind of rules r- rules the group, but that's not it's <laughs> not structured in any formal way like the men naturally arrange themselves into hierarchies when we get into a group of any larger than say three right um but i i i think it's really important you said many really important things but one of them is is that you felt convicted in yourself of the example that you were being and i think that that's a very powerful thing that um that's honorable because uh you say you, you said uh look at the fruit now that was written in the time before social media so when social media we can hire photographers, editors, whatever to come in and make it appear like we have all this quote unquote fruit in our lives. And there are plenty of examples of that daily where it's like, oh, it would seem that this person, look, this person is blessed by God with all this money. It's like, well, if you were to peel back that layer of social media and see who they actually are when the cameras go off, right? When they're, when they're at home or privately or whatever, you might get a real different sense of what the, of what the fruit is, because you can fake almost anything through social media. You can fake it with, with deep fakes. You can fake anything through social media right now, but the fruit that you're talking about right now is like, I have to change my life. That is essential. And I know that feeling very well. We started out the conversation talking about how I've been, you know, I've been a Christian for about three years coming up, coming off of, you know, 30, 30 or so years till 20 years in the new age, but being interested in religion and spirituality for 30 years, you know, I have felt that almost weekly over the past few years, like I have to change my love. I have to get rid of this thing. In fact, I, I've traveled a bit around the world and I've participated in new age practices like ayahuasca being one of them. And, you know, for, for listeners who, or viewers who know about uh, Joe Rogan and Aubrey Marcus, they talk about ayahuasca, this, this plant, they call it a medicine, this plant potion that you drink. Mm. I've, I've participated in those. And I had this prayer mat that I bought from a retreat, retreat center that I went to. And I was looking at that. I'm like, I got to burn that. And so this past weekend, I set that on fire out on my out on my deck, and that's been an ongoing thing. Like just getting rid of all these things that I'm that I'm carrying, that I've had these souvenirs from my travels, and knowing that I have to change my speech, I have to change my behavior, I have to take every thought captive. Like regenerating as a being, sanctification, that's mm. real. That's real, and that's genuine fruit. That it can't be measured with our eyes necessarily from the outside but we feel it in our hearts and you run it out over five year timelines. Like that is a different person than the person who I was five years ago. Mm. And I, and I think that that's, that's ultimately what I think people are looking for. They're looking for a new experience of themselves. And they think if I can achieve, if I can earn more, if I can have more, then I'll be that version of myself that I know. And, and my experience from having tried that for a long time is that it actually comes from, from true faith in Christ. And I can say that. And it's, it's, it's pretty cool to be able to say that because I looked for it for a long time. Yeah, that's incredible. I, um, I have a friend of mine. She's, she's a, a good friend of mine. And I often joke around with her. You're just a closet Christian. Just admit <laughs> it by now because she's very much into all of the new, all of the religion and spirituality and she believes yeah. in God, but she thinks that it's individual for her. And she, she sounds like she, she's on the journey that you were on, right? And yeah. I'm just faithfully, patiently praying for her soul um, and, you know, hoping and praying that she has that moment where it clicks in her head like it did for you three years ago. Can, can I just ask, like, what? Yeah. Like, what was it? What was the catalyst that, that just got you? Because she's so intelligent that, and she's so well-versed on all these other things, all these other ideas, right, that she's got an answer for everything. Um, what was it for you that kind of just sent you into that, into Christ's arms? <laughs> it was a, it was a, it was a 30 year, a 30 year trajectory of, of seeking yeah. really. Um, so the, the, the relatively short version of my testimony is I was born Jewish, I was bar mitzvahed, you know, when I was 13, my Torah portion was the 10 commandments, right? Which is pretty cool. That was randomly assigned. I didn't choose that. <laughs> And, and um, but I, I was essentially functionally atheist as, as many American reformed Jews are, but 
made in God's image, I still had a spiritual hunger. So I went to the Bay Area to go to school at Stanford University in the late 90s. And of course, the Bay Area is full of new age, Eastern mystical kind of practices. Mm -hmm. And I found my way into the the rave dance and DJ world. And of course, that world is full of, of those influences as well. And it was in that world that I first started getting exposed to other faith traditions. And I just found that I had a real interested interest in it. Um, now, nothing could be further from Christianity. So Christianity had really no influence over that world, except for like, gosh, there's such prudes killing the vibe, but I had no real experience, <laughs> right? I had no real experience of Christianity, but I was marinating in new age stuff and Buddhism and Hinduism and all that. Um, and that was just, that was just what I did for the next say 15 or so years. Um, wandered all the way, you know, into, into some pretty esoteric practices, um, including, you know, I studied the tarot and Kabbalah and occult practices as well. And I'm not thrilled to say that. And that's one of the things that God has delivered me from. Um, but in 2015, um, I was coming off of a breakup. And in the Bay Area, you can just go to Burning Man, which maybe you've heard of the Burning Man Festival. I have heard. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, so for those who don't know, it's a it's a pagan festival, 80,000 people in the desert outside of Reno, Nevada. Happens every year in the week leading up to Labor Day, so roughly the last week of August. And so um, it's it's quite an ordeal to go because it's out there in, in the desert, essentially like a dry lake bed. And But coming from the Bay Area, it's about five hours away. So I'm like, well, I just went through a breakup. Let me go out to Burning Man because I can. And uh, when I got there, I met a guy who was telling me, well, if you're coming off a breakup and you're dealing with grief, you should go to this camp Spirit Dream. They can help you with that. Like, okay. So I went to this camp called Spirit Dream and I sat down uh, in, the, in the tent and I had a three and a half hour conversation with three lovely people, Barb, Katie, uh, and Larry, his, his plan name was GI. And uh, Katie was a woman in her early 50s and Barb was in her 40s and, and Larry was in his 70s where I was just really having the opportunity to reconcile and forgive, go through a lot of forgiveness in my, in my childhood for things that had happened in my past, which is pretty common for a lot of inner healing. Um, and the new age people will be familiar with that. But at the end of that encounter, Katie was standing behind me. It sounded like she was praying and, uh, I had, and I had my eyes closed. And with my eyes closed, I had this kind of vision and the vision was of a street on the, on the playa, you know, the people riding by on their bikes and flags flapping in the breeze and dust blowing in the wind. And this man, and with my eyes closed, this man walks up to me and he's wearing ski goggles, um, which people have to wear out there to protect themselves from the dust. And he walks up to me, I see roughly the shape of his head and the hair went under the goggles. And I'm like, okay. And then the face just seems to insist like, no, look, I'm like, okay, I see you. And uh, so I saw the head, the face, and then um, I opened my eyes and Katie says, there's someone I want you to meet, okay? So I follow her around to the other side of the tent to uh, the side of a, a four post kind of pillar that I couldn't have seen. She turns me around, she points me up at the pillar and there on the pillar was painted the face that I had just seen with my eyes closed, minus the goggles. And it was the face of Jesus Christ, a very famous portrait from the painter Akiane, who's a 12 year old girl who painted who painted this face and it was a very stunning moment i said well who are you people and she said we're christians we've been running a ministry here at burning man underground for the past 12 years ministering to people who are broken and searching they didn't put a big cross up they weren't handing out tracts they were just there to show the father's love to people who were hungry and and lost and searching like i was and um, that was my introduction to christ and to christianity and really into the heart of it like it wasn't, it, again, it wasn't preachy. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, judgmental. It was just loving. It was purely loving the father's love. And then um, I didn't actually become a Christian after that. Um, I went and I traveled uh, about nine months later and I went overseas and did all of the new age stuff, including ayahuasca. And I went to a Hindu festival, 190 million Hindus bathed in the Ganges river where it's clean. And then I did Buddhist meditation <laughs> retreats and all this new age stuff. But there was one question you asked, what was it that finally drew, drove me to Christ? There was one question that I was really sitting with, which is, um, what is the nature of evil? And in the new age world, they're not really good at talking about evil. Now, I knew about Jeffrey Epstein, and I had a real hard time with what some of the new age people would say, like evil is an illusion, a trick of our subjective minds. And it's like, ask the little girl being sex trafficked if evil is subjective, mm -hmm. right? If, if she needs to, if this is some experience her soul needs to have, like what a ridiculous thing to say. 
And so I was sitting with this knowledge and I couldn't find anyone to give me a good answer. I got back to the United States in February of 2020. My friends who I had met from Spirit Dream gave me a book called Simply Christian by N.T. Wright. And uh, in that book, N.T. Wright rocks, talks about how Christ up on the cross, uh, this giant wave of evil was going to crash over him and through his death and sacrifice, he drove back the wave of evil forever. And when, when I read that, I, I got it. Because here was a faith willing to talk openly and acknowledge evil as a real thing. This faith has something to say about evil, this question that I'd always have, here's someone who's willing to talk to me about it. And then I read uh, Mere Christianity and, and Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. And then I asked my friends to baptize me in September of 2020. And, and so it's, it's Christianity's no-nonsense approach to evil. Evil is real. It hates the good. It wants to destroy the good. It's ultimately powerless, um, but it has real presence, and it's not an illusion. Um, and, and through Christ, you can, um, you can triumph over evil with him. And um, mm -hmm. that was why... I, that was why I chose to become Christian. It was, I mean, <laughs> best decision I ever made. Mm. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. It's, it's a, it's, there, there's a moment where it does click, but then from that moment, you are forever changing, forever sanctifying yes. yourself. And, and that's what I, I think it's important for us to say, you know, none of us are perfect. None of us Christians <laughs> get it right. My Same. goodness. Like every single day, I'm, people often say, You're so judgmental. I'm like, you have no idea how much I judge myself. I can't stand myself. And I, I just want to change all of the evil that I see within my heart. And, you know, that that's that's half the battle is is admitting to yourself that you have the presence of evil inside of you and you need to get rid of it. And how do you get rid of it? By shining a light on it. How do you get that? The Holy Spirit dwells yes. inside of you. That is his temple. Um, and then because the Holy Spirit is inside of you, you can't help but be disgusted by evil. It is repulsive to you once you get yeah. to that that place of realization but praise god that those that group was at the burning man like that is the most pagan i've seen some instagram things on that mm -hmm. i had somebody who is an organizer for that start following me and i was like who's this person with a lot of followers following me i'm a nobody and i looked and was just like oh I don't, I don't know if I want them to follow me because um, I had my yeah. account on private at the time. So I didn't allow them to follow me because I was like, oh, I don't want to even go there. Um, but that's what introduced me to the burning. I didn't have any clue about it until that point. Um, and yeah, wow, there's people that are in, in the battle zone in there trying to preach the word of Jesus. And essentially, I guess that's what planted the seed um, that eventually took root in your journey. So God bless them for putting themselves out there like that. Do you still talk to them today? This is totally like, just, I'm just curious. Yeah. I flew yeah. up to spend the weekend, spend like five days with them about a month ago. It was great. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. I, I love stories like that. Um, I think it's incredible. And I think that's important for us as brothers and sisters in this space and as brothers and sisters who are fighting against the evil, like we're out there saying, this is an evil patriarchy, follow this one. We're out there saying, this is an evil matriarchy, follow this one. We're, we're out there doing these things. We need to, we need to foster relationships, I think, better. I, and, and this is something I'm convicted on as well. I, I'd like to not just point and complain on the internet and do that. I'd like to be somebody in real life that can help women. Um, and uh, I'm not perfect and I'm learning as I go, but I'd like to do a better job of that in real life, being a woman who is there for other women, you know, and in real life being someone who, um, yeah, can, can be there for people on the journey, not just at the beginning, but throughout the whole thing. I think that's part of the sanctification for ourselves as well. So, um, oh, yeah. incredible. I love that they did that. I'm so like taken back by that and that you still have a relationship with them. That's amazing. Praise they're God. They're wonderful human beings. They're very, they're very faithful and very devout. And I'm very lucky to have them as teachers. Mm. I'm very, I'm very lucky to have them, um, in my life and, and, you know, what you're saying makes me think of a term that it comes up a lot. It's a cult of cults of personality. It's very easy for men and women searching out information about masculinity and femininity to to fall into cults of personality where they make an individual an idol. You know, not just mm -hmm. Andrew Tate, he's an example, but there are countless examples. 
And the problem with cults of personality is that ultimately you will find that this individual that you're worshiping does not live up to the standard in your own heart. They will all fall, fall short. I will fall short. I fall short every day. Every true Christian will admit that they fall short in every day. Mm. The one man in history who did not fall short was Jesus Christ. Yes. Right. And 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 uh, as as a son of God, as the as the man to emulate, we will never mm. be him. <laughs> we can't yeah. ever achieve it. But we can we can screw up. We can make mistakes. We can confess them. We can repent and try again. And we have that ability to achieve forgiveness and transformation and regeneration that the secular world doesn't offer. It doesn't offer any hope of redemption. Once you apologize in the public sphere, right, you're gone. That's why no one ever apologizes, yeah. right? Because they have no hope of the public will not offer them redemption. Christ yeah. offers redemption, true yeah. repentance and transformation. And I think people are th they're thirsting for that. Mm. And they're afraid of it because they feel convicted of their own sins. Yeah. And that's hard. I get it. I get it. And you take that leap of faith, apologizing, and you find that you're you're caught, and then you fly, <laughs> and it's a beautiful feeling. But you have to take that risk of that leap of faith. It's a real thing. Mm, absolutely, I think you know nature hates a void. It's that's that's what it is. Nature hates a void, and we're trying to fill it with people and figures that will never fill that void. They're incapable of yeah. it. And I love what you mentioned. You know, Christ. He's the only person we should be pointing people to. And he's yeah. and if people reflect Christ, then that's great. That can be that God uses a means to his end. And if he can use people to that end, that's great. But they need to reflect Christ because Christ is the only thing that can fill that void, that hungry yeah. void. And I think people like Tate and all these this I, I even I'm something that I'm finding I'm being really like, whoa, about lately is the trad life for women. It's become yeah. a form of idolatry as well. Absolutely. Just like this alpha idea has become idolatry tree where you're idolizing things that do not bring glory to him you know it says you know when you i i'm catechized and you know the first question is what is the chief end of man to glorify god and enjoy him forever yes mm. there is a biblical um m masculine way to glorify god and enjoy him forever and there's a biblical feminine way to glorify god and enjoy him forever and that will be practically different for each of those but mm -hmm. everything we do needs to yeah reflect christ and him alone because he is the only consistent redemptive figure that is out there everything else will always fall short including you and me so um i think that's Absolutely. unfortunately the problem with the masculine and feminine movements that we see i often say that mass the alpha masculinity movement is feminism for men and people oh, yeah. push back and go, why? And I go, well, it's because they're birds of the same feather. They both hate the opposite gender. And I think mm -hmm. too often this secular worldly idea of masculinity basically says me first, men first. Yes, yes. And this feminine, uh, feminist movement is women first, women first, women first. And I was like, that's not how it should be. What can I what can I give to this other person, not what can I get for myself? And I think these movements are so narcissistic in mm -hmm. nature and they pit, you know, each other against the opposite sex. They divide and as you know, we know, you know divide and conquer and that's how Satan does it. So I think mm -hmm. if we just glorify God and enjoy him forever in our biblical roles that God has given us, that which are inherently different, and if we reflect Christ to fill that void and point people to that, then I don't think we can go wrong. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, may, I, may I share something with you about that? I think, I think it'll, I, I, it's something that I've been kicking around lately, some ideas I've been turning over in my head. I think feminism and the manosphere and red pill space, space, they're both children of the sexual revolution. Now, what was the sexual revolution? Well, they say it's separate sexual liberation. What was liberated? It wasn't men and women's sexuality that was liberated. The sexual, the sexual liberation was liberating women's sexuality from the constraints of marriage, meaning like your sexuality, your procreative sexuality is now yours. You can do whatever you want with it instead of put it towards civilization building because men build civilization with their hands, and with their heads, right, and their bodies, right? Women build civilization with their bodies in a very different way by producing people, right? And that's a <laughs> yeah. vital part of building civilization. You need people. Well, sexual liberation liberated women's sexuality from the constraints of the family. They were very open about that. 
And so now you have women's sexuality liberated into the public sphere. And then what happens? Well, you have all this supply of what we might call sex, mm -hmm. which creates demand. And where's the demand coming from? The demand is coming from these fatherless men preying on essentially fatherless women, right? And so yeah. when you talk about godly sexuality to people, it's one man and one woman for life, period, end of discussion. Adultery, sin. You know, thou shalt not even covet thy neighbor's wife. That's God's. Yeah. God gave us 10, 10 laws, 10 commandments. That was one of them. Yeah. So one man and one woman for life. Now, if you talk to feminism, feminism says, why should I just give my sexuality to one man for life? Why should I do that? What does the manosphere say? Why should I, why, why should I only be content with one woman for life? Mm. Right. And so the core issue is around what we do with our sexuality, whether we use our sexuality for godly purposes, for producing fruit for the kingdom, for being fruitful and multiplying or being fruitless. And that's how you can see that these are two wings of the same bird. You have feminism resisting Christianity because I shouldn't be giving my sexuality to one patriarchal man. And you have the manosphere resisting Christianity because I shouldn't be giving my sexuality to one woman. Both are children of the sexual revolution with the manosphere being the younger child of the two, but there have been additional children as well, LGBT, LGBT the transgender movement yeah. and all of that as well. But these are all children of the sexual revolutions of, the, of sexual liberation. And if anyone wants to disappear down a very, uh, uh, very far rabbit hole, I recommend researching uh, Wilhelm Reich, who coined the phrase the sexual revolution, and he was a communist. The sexual revolution was, in, was entirely a communistic value. So um, you can you can explore that, but so then you have men and women trying to uh, trying to reestablish godly sexuality, and we're getting enormous pushback from every direction, and that's how you know it's right. Yes. If you say one man and one woman marrying young for life, that's how you know that it's right because that's the one thing you're not allowed to do in our culture. Absolutely, it's it's so frowned upon. What's the actress's name who is in um, Stranger Things? The young eleven, uh, Millie oh. Bobby. Millie Bobby Brown. Bobby Brown, yeah, she's yeah. like nineteen and getting married. She's like, I love this man. I'm going to spend the rest of my life with him. And Good Hollywood are losing their minds. They're like, you're too young, sweetheart. What are you doing? And I'm in the background going, go you. Yes, yeah. put a ring on it. Um, yeah, be fruitful well, you know, and multiply. That's well, yeah. you know, you know why that is though, because women's sexuality is supposed to be liberated from marriage. That's yeah. how they can say that it's that it's bad for her to get married. But if she were to start on OnlyFans, they would celebrate it. Good why? For you, sweetie. It's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you're using your sexuality to benefit your finances instead of your husband. You should mm -hmm. hate men enough to deprive them of sexuality. You should make money with your sexuality instead. That's the yeah. godly godlessness of the sexual revolution, yeah. of sexual liberation, and of feminism. Yeah. I think everything that we're seeing today is a rejection of Genesis. I think that yeah. everything, like I, people often say, you're striving for 1950. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm striving for Eden. I want the garden. Take <laughs> so me good. back to the garden, please. Yeah. Because, you know, God created everything, right? He created the heavens. He created the, the seas. He created the moon, the sun, the stars. He created all of the creatures that crawl on the earth, that fly in the sky, that swim in the sea. Then he created man. And what did he do with man? He gave, he gave man a purpose. He hadn't created woman yet. He gave man a purpose and he said, you have dominion. You need to steward this. You need to look after this garden. You get to name these, these animals. You get to do all these things. And then once he had given Adam his purpose, then he created Eve to be his helper with that purpose. So men need to have a mission. They need to be on a mission. The woman should not be the mission and the woman should help the man with his mission. And everything that we're seeing today is a rejection of that idea. Like you said, everything yes. that we see is a rejection of Eden. And I think that it's that simple. Even the climate yeah. thing is a rejection of Eden because God literally said to Adam, you need to work the land. He didn't say, let it be a wilderness. Let's not chop trees down in the name of not no logging and this and that. He literally said to Adam, keep the garden, right? And, and a garden is a garden. He didn't say a wild forest that was untamed <laughs> and unkept. Adam kept the garden. And then as him and Eve would have multiplied, they would have extended and the whole world would have been a big giant garden. Like, take me back there. I, I want to eat. Um, and so everything is just a rejection of that. That's how I see it. And unfortunately, um, 
yeah, we're, we're just getting duped into believing that there's alternatives to Eden. Eden is perfection. That was before the fall. And that is exactly how we were designed to live, which is why we're all so hungry for it. There's a void in everyone in their in our inherited natures. There's this void because we're not living how we were created to live. So we will always be striving for that. And, um, you know, I, I think we should just take men and women back to the garden. I don't know about you, but I, I'd like to go back. <laughs> Preach. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. I, I just, yeah. I want to applaud that. I mean, that was, that was a brilliant, that was a brilliant rebuttal to you just want to go back to the 1950s. It's like, no, I want to go back to Eden. Like what yes. an incredible, what an incredible <laughs> response because it puts that, it puts that entire meme just, just in the ground, you know, where, where it belongs because, you know, the 1950s is this cognitive red light when people hear it. It's like, oh, what do I think about that? Right. But you, you said it, you said it so perfectly so perfectly and not only it's a, it's a corruption and it's an inversion because god's created order is you know christ submits to god man submits to christ the woman submits to the man and the children submit to the woman well, what do we see instead you remove mm. god and christ from the equation and everything gets flipped on its head right the man submits to the woman and the woman submits to the children right that's yes. what, so we have children essentially running and, and it's and it's uh it's they're ruling the roost and it's just it's just a disaster and it doesn't work and it's fruitless and yeah. it's absolutely fruitless. And this is this is the big the big trick behind climate change and all the liberal policies is that ultimately it's fruitless and produces no next generation. Of course, they mm. guilt and shame people into saying that people are essentially toxic on the planet, which we should worship the planet instead of worship God. And that's that's the big that's the mm. big trick, right? Versus yeah. if you say no, like let's go back to Eden where we were we were we were given dominion over the world to cultivate mm. it. Right. And people say I'm an environmentalist. I'm a conservationist. I'm not an yeah. environmentalist. I'm a conservationist. Yeah. I'm all about conserving our natural resources, but also putting them in right use for humanity. Mm. And you sent a brilliant tweet the other day that that um, I think that was yesterday where you said industrial farming. I don't know how you said it was a disaster. It's an evil. abomination. <laughs> it's an abomination. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Toiva. Absolutely. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. And we feel that in our hearts. So we live in this way where it's like, well, we've essentially quote unquote taken dominion, but it's in this real, it's this, in, it's in this literally abominable way is, that cuts yeah. at all of us. But that takes us right back to the household, to homesteading, to small subsistence farming, which we started the conversation. There's something very godly and divine about that. And mm -hmm. it's, it's just yet another way that everything is upside down and we're deprived of that image of the productive household. Again, mm -hmm. C.R. Wiley, The Household and the War for the Cosmos, a brilliant book yes. that paints that picture. I might also recommend Rory Grove's Durable Trades about ways to have godly, godly businesses in your home. And mm -hmm. men, are, men and women are both waking up to this longing that's in our hearts that's been suppressed for a long time. And it's a beautiful thing to see because I think we're all looking for wanting to get back to Eden. There's a cherub with a flaming sword guarding it. So maybe, maybe it won't quite get back in, but the image yeah. lives very deeply in our hearts. And, and I think it's a, it's yeah. a good and godly image to aspire to. Absolutely. We, we will get back there one day. And in the meantime, sure. we can, we can plant the fruit trees now. So our kids can um, benefit from them and eventually Christ will bring Eden 2.0 back and I can't wait. But um, I might <laughs> I might wrap that up for today. It's been amazing to sort of pick your brain on these ideas. Where can people find you? Where can people listen to your podcast, um, social media? Go for it. Yeah, you can find me basically everywhere at Ren of Men. And that's R-E-N-O-F-M-E-N, -E like Renaissance of Men, but shorter at Ren of Men. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube slash at Ren of Men, and you can find all of those by going to Linktree slash Ren of Men. And I encourage everyone watching to go to YouTube slash at Ren of Men and watch my 20 minute video, What is the Renaissance? that gives an overview of the 150 year war on masculinity and the 40 year Renaissance of Men, the process to redeem men, women, families for the kingdom. Hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you again for coming on today. It's been a real pleasure, a real joy, and I look forward to upsetting people on the internet with you even further moving forward. Thank you, Evelyn. All, for, all glory <laughs> to God. Let's yes. do it.